much. We are in the book of Acts tonight, the book of Acts. Acts. I'm not sure how far we'll get in the book of Acts tonight. But we shall start uh, the book of Acts tonight. I'm going to make some comments and we're going to start the book of Acts. Father, we thank you again. Father, I thank you so very much for your goodness to us tonight. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that for fervent, passionate, with zeal, prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Father, I pray tonight as we start in, Lord, on the book of Acts tonight, Father, I pray that you would give us clearness, and Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would be students of the word. Father, that you would help us, Lord, as we study it. Lord, we need to be ready to give an answer to every man that asks us the reason of the hope that lies within us. And Lord, I pray that you'll open your word to us. Dear God, we need to. And Lord, not just for knowing facts. Even lost people can learn facts about the Bible. But Lord, that we might apply those facts, Lord, to our life. Lord, that we might be, Lord, better students of the Word of God, better witnesses for the Lord Jesus, better example to the other believers. Lord, I pray that you would, you would help us, Lord, with that. Lord, I pray now that you're blessed in the few minutes we have. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Ben told me a story today about being an example the job he got really was a miracle from God. It was. Uh, he didn't even know how to drive a truck, let alone uh, a pumper truck. S the, the secretary who was part owner said he doesn't hire people like that. Now a man has come up to him who was a Christian who goes to church, and the first time he went out on the job, he noticed Ben. And he wants Ben to sit down with him on Saturday because he wants to offer Ben a job. Ben probably ain't going to take the job, but it's like the man said to him, the first time I went out on the job and you were there, I saw you. I noticed you. He said, it didn't take me long to figure out that you were a Christian. Ben said this to me today. He said, Dad, whether we like it or not, People are watching me. Whether I like it or not, people are watching me. And they're watching all of us to be an example for Christ. And that's why we, we want to learn more about the Bible so that we can be students of the Bible, so that we can apply it to our lives, not so much that we're, we're, we, we know the facts, but that we can apply it to our, our lives to be a better testimony for Christ. Now, the uh, we've said this, that the Old Testament, there are 12 books of history. In the New Testament, there's only one. And it is a book that has not been completed yet. Uh, it is called the Acts of the Apostles, but we usually just call it Acts. Uh, it was written by, who knows who Acts was written by? It was written by Luke, exactly. Uh, he, of course, wrote the book of Luke, and he said in chapter 1, the former treaty have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. You know, that's, that's important in our lives. He both did it and he taught it. You know, it's one thing that I tell you, ah, don't smoke cigarettes, kids. Ah, we don't want you smoking cigarettes. Cigarettes are bad for you. And then you smoke cigarettes all the time. And, or, it's another thing. If we uh, try to teach our kids, uh, if, if you don't, and, and then, but then you don't even live it. See, Jesus both did it, he both taught it, and he lived it. So Luke made it clear, the writer made it clear, the former treaty, of course, was the Gospel of Luke. And Acts begins where Luke leaves off. And the book of Acts is a book of history. That really is the beginning of the church. 
And because the church age has not ended yet, really the book of Acts is still continuing. Now, the book of Acts, there are several things about the book of Acts. Number one, it is a book of transition. It is a book that goes from the law to grace. It is a transition from Jews to Gentiles. Because at the beginning, at Jerusalem, when, when Peter preached, there were multitudes of Jewish people who believed. But then, as we'll see, uh, Peter actually goes to the Gentiles, to some Italian fellows, and man, they all got saved, and uh, then, then real trouble started in the church uh, because of Gentile believers and Jewish believers. Uh, the Jews at first did not really want to accept the Gentiles. Uh, and Paul wrote Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 about the fact that the Jews have been temporarily set aside and that the Gentiles are now being in, are engrafted uh, into the olive tree. We are the wild branch that's been engrafted in. And so the book of Acts is a book of transition. Uh, it starts with, if, if we can say this, the Old Testament ideas and goes to grace. Um, we, you know, we, get, we learn many things from the book of Acts. Now, I do not expect you to know this, but if we started in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1 is about what? Does anybody know? Acts chapter 1 is about the church. There are only 120 of them, and the apostles, and they're in the upper room. Jesus has left. Uh, he was here for 40 days. He then told them to wait at Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Ghost. And so while they were there, they were in one accord. Uh, they, 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 they were praying together. And then they decided, well, we need to find somebody to fill Judas's place. Now, I've often wondered this. In heaven, in the new Jerusalem, there are 12 foundations to the city. And in those 12 foundations are the names of the apostles. Well, we know one of them is not Judas. So the question then would be, who is the 12th apostle? Now, we know from chapter 1, anybody remember who was the apostle that was elected by the disciples to take Judas' place? Anybody remember? Matthias. Matthias. Well, is Matthias' name going to be there? Did the apostles jump the gun? Was Paul going to be the 12th? And in Acts chapter 14, we won't look at it, but it says this, the apostles, Paul and Barnabas. Was Barnabas an apostle? Now, the, Luke called him the apostles, Paul and Barnabas. Was, was Barnabas an apostle? Now, we, we again realize an apostle... Uh, was there were several things. One, you had to have seen the resurrected Christ. Uh, did Barnabas, was he one of the 500? That, that was saved. But in Acts chapter 1, we find really the nucleus, if you would. Now, I know that people disagree about the church. Good people disagree about it. I know that, that some people believe the church began in the Old Testament because somebody, I believe Paul said, the church of Israel. Well, the church, the word church merely means a called out group. That's what it is, ecclesia, a called out group. And we've been called out. We've been called out of the world. That's what we are. Well, Israel was called out of Egypt. And they went. So we could say, well, in a technical sense, they were a church because they were called out. But in the New Testament sense, some people think that the church began in Matthew 16. When Jesus said, uh, upon this rock, I will build, but saying I will build would seem to indicate future. But there are people who believe the church began in, in Matthew chapter 16. Other people believe that the church began in John chapter 20. When Jesus appeared to the disciples and he breathed on them 
and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Some have, asked, have, have said, Well, I think the church began there. Uh, other people believe that, like I do, I think the church began here in the book of Acts. Now, the th I, I think that the one of the things that would make the church the church would be the Holy Ghost. Now, in chapter 1, Jesus said in the first several verses, wait in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, probably one of the most familiar verses in the Bible. But after that, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the world. You're going to be witnesses for me. So then they retreat to the upper room, about 120 of them, uh, some of Jesus' brother, uh, others who were followers of Christ, some of the women. Mary was there. And they chose that. So in Acts chapter 1, we now begin the transition from law to grace. In Acts chapter 2, who knows what Acts chapter 2 was about? Anybody know what Acts chapter 2 was about? Huh? Pentecost. How many days after Passover was Pentecost? How many? 50. Pent. 50. Okay. Now, how many days was Jesus here before he left? Forty, right. That's how many days. So they tarried eight, nine. I'm not sure it was exactly ten days because the Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. Jesus was crucified for three days. So he was here for 40 days. So they may have tarried for a week in Jerusalem. And the Holy Ghost came upon them in Acts chapter 2. And they all began to speak. Notice in Acts chapter 2, let's look at that for just a moment. It tells us this uh, in verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, where these 120-some were. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses came to me once, said to me one day. They came up, and they, I was out in the yard. I was... They came up and they, you know, I, I immediately start browbeating them because they believe that Christ has returned. Uh, they, they'll give you, I, I think they have seven or eight dates that Christ returned. I believe the first one was 1914. Uh, then they said 1917. Then I believe the next date was 1918. And I forget the other. I believe one date was 1941. Uh, but they have all these dates. And I, I said to them, you know, uh, did anybody see him? Did anybody see him come back? Because in Acts chapter 1, the angel said, this same Jesus was taken up from you into heaven, so, so come again in like manner you've seen him go. And their reply to me was, well, there was only just a couple dozen that actually saw him leave, and there were just a few people that actually saw him come again. Now, and so I, you know, well, no, the Bible says that every eye shall behold it. And the guy had his son with him, so he grabbed his kid and he left. But, you know, it's like there weren't a lot of people. But the Holy Ghost, wherever they were, the Holy Ghost came upon them. And you'll note what it says. And they there appealed, appeared under them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues or other languages. They were known languages. How do you know that, preacher? Because it tells us there in chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, and how here we every man in our own tongue, our own language, wherein we were born. And it gives a list. I think there are either 15 or 19 different languages, and everybody there said, well, we, we hear in our own language. Now, were the apostles speaking in that language or were they merely uh, uh, hearing uh, what it was? I'm not, I'm not a charismatic. I'm not a tongue speaker. I know that there are a lot of people like that today. I know that some people make tongue speaking 
a basis of salvation. Uh, I met an Assembly of God guy once. I, he was working on a beetle, uh, a bug, you know, one of those yellow cars like Bonnie had. And if you know anything about beetles, you're always working on those things. But anyway, it's like uh, he was kind of underneath the dashboard, up underneath the dashboard. I don't know what he was doing up there. And I just, you know, out by myself witnessing. And I said to him, I said, sir, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you, ever, you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. And he didn't answer me, well, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. The first thing he said to me was, have you ever spoken tongues? But well, being a smart out, I haven't said I have enough problem with English, uh, let alone uh, another language. And he didn't want to talk to me anymore. But, you know, it's like some people uh, base, and, and they, base, they base being filled with the Holy Ghost. Have you spoken tongues since you were filled with the Holy Ghost? Some people, and, and I, I started to say this a few minutes ago about the, about the church, why I believe the church began at Pentecost. Is because the Holy Spirit came and endued them with power. And one of the things about this is in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For we have all been baptized into one body. All of us. Now, the charismatic said, well, have you ever been baptized by the Holy Spirit? And the answer to that is absolutely. Everybody that's saved been baptized by the Holy Spirit. But they want to use that as a basis for being filled. Now, the truth is, Paul said in Ephesians 3, uh, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to yourselves, in, uh, I think it says psalms, hymns, and spiritual melodies. I may have reversed those a couple there, but speaking to yourself. Uh, and so my, my, my feeling is that the church began at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and baptized all those people into the body of Christ. Uh, the church is the body of Christ. Now, I, I know, I've said this a ton of times. There, there are people, good people. I mean, they're, they're good people, uh, seriously. Uh, I, I really do believe that there is a universal body of believers. I didn't say a universal church, but I said there is a universal body of believers. Every saved person makes up the body of Christ. Now, I am big on the, on the local church. I do not believe, as some believe, that there is a universal church. There is, a, I believe, and, and you're really hard-pressed to prove a universal church, but I don't think you're hard-pressed to prove there's a universal body of believers. So at Pentecost, they all heard them. Now, they, the, the guys said, well, these guys are drunk. I think it was 9 o'clock in the morning, and they're drunk. Now, that is ridiculous, because if, if that were so, if everybody can learn to speak by another language by being drunk, I mean, you could do away with Rosetta Stone and all these other things, you know. But they, they said, well, they're all drunk. And Peter just said, well, they're not, they're not drunk as you think they are. That's not it. And so then Peter in chapter 2 begins to preach uh, to these people. And, I, you know, my favorite book, as you know, is the book of John. That, that is my favorite book. I'm reading it again. My second favorite book is the book of Acts. I just, and I've read that book, and I've read that book. After Peter preaches, thousands, look at chapter 2, toward the end, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly. No, I'm, verse 41 is one I want. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Those that were saved were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So I'm thinking, I've thought this, I've prayed this, I've asked God this many times. What is it that was so unique about the New Testament church that not only are 3,000 saved here, but Peter preaches again in the next chapter, the fourth chapter, and I believe there are 4,000 added to the church, 4,000 saved. And I say, oh God, 
What is it that made that church so spectacular? I mean, let's face it. It says about Elijah. We think Elijah was a great guy. He was a great guy. Subject to depression. Subject to discouragement. But yet he prayed, and it did not rain, according to James, for three and a half years. But he was a man subject to like passions as we are. I'm sure that Peter was. James, I'm sure all those guys were. Were they sinless? No. Perfect. No. What made the New Testament church so great that thousands upon thousands, and the Bible says this, that there were added unto them daily, Added daily. Now, I, I know partially the answer to that. And I'm not, I'm not discounting the power of God. But I know the age in which we live. I, I know that this age is that people are not concerned People could care less about heaven, about church, about you know where they're going when they die. They're not really interested. You say, well, maybe that was true back then. Maybe, maybe they weren't interested. Maybe it was just the power of God. I know that we live in a different age. I'm, I'm well aware of that. I'm not sure which one of the gospel writers said some will increase 100-fold, some 60-fold, some 30-fold, indicating a downward progression of people being saved in the last days. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. So, you know, it's like, but, well, anyway, we're back to it. And I'll say one other thing. The second thing I, I, I believe about this, about the early church, when they were in the upper room in chapter 1, that they all continued together. They, it says in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and, in, and by, I got it under, I can't read it, breaking of bread, and in prayer. Uh -huh. And prayer. When we get to chapter 6, and the first deacons are chosen to help out, wait on tables, the apostles said, it's not reasonable that we leave the word of God to wait on tables. But we will give ourselves continually the word of God and prayer. Brother Bassett, little prayer, little power, some prayer, some power, much prayer, much power. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of Bob. I listen to him. And the more I listen to him, the more I like him. The guy that comes on that's from Egypt. You, who? No, nah, he's from India. I like Ravi Zachariah too. You know, I like him too. But, but uh, he's on at like 6 o'clock in the morning. And there is a 6 o'clock in the morning. But uh, he is, uh, I can't think of his name. It, the name of his program is Leading the Way. And I heard him this morning and... He was talking about the effectual fervent prayer. Well, what it, fervent means to pray with a passion. Not just, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, don't let me die with a tummy ache. You know, that, that kind of thing. It's like, it, it is passionate. I think the apostles were passionate in their praying. So the Holy Spirit comes in chapter 2. Thousands are saved and baptized. My brother, you know, how they baptize all those people, Arnold? I was wondering, you know, here they, they're just transfixing from. Yeah. And, and this would be so new. Right. And they realized this is real. This is really it. I think they had like a newness of God, a new, a new knowledge of God that they never had, they never understood. 
You know that I've said about the apostles, you cannot explain them apart from the resurrection. Here they all forsook him. Peter denied him. They all forsook him. Now, what happened? The Holy Spirit came. Changed them. They, they, uh, again, somebody at the bus garage, I watched you Sunday. I said, oh, no. No, I said it was good. He said, we were going to come. We've been going to come a couple times. I said, well, why don't you come? We haven't killed anybody. I said, why don't you come? Come on, come. But people, they watch us. They, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to, I'll say, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not proud of this. I am not proud of this. I am not. I, I've worked all over. I've done all kinds of jobs. All kinds of jobs. Uh, one of my jobs was I worked on putting these high power lines up. Uh, and in 19, uh, 1971, trying to think, 1971, I was making good money, $3.50 an hour. I'm telling you, man, that was top dollar then. And uh, I, I was working out and Something happened. Something really happened. And I said something I shouldn't have said. And the guy looked at me and said, that's the first time I've ever heard you say anything like that. And you know the Holy Spirit, boom, hit me right there. Ryan Battles lives over in Port Lyon. Some of you may know, know him. We were out in the woods one day with Tripper, and we were way out in the woods somewhere. I don't even know where we were. And I was talking to John about being saved, and, and Battle says, everybody cusses. And I'll never forget this. John looked at him and said, Jim doesn't. Look, people look at us whether we want them to or not. And as, like Arnold was saying, there's something different about these guys now. I mean, they're... They're not what they used to be. They're, they're different. So in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches under the power and the influence of the Holy Ghost, and multitudes of people are saved. And we're going to hit chapter 3 uh, tonight. We may take some time with the book of Acts. We're not going to look at every verse. But in chapter 3, something miraculous happens. Peter and John are going up to the temple about the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour which was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You say, oh, preacher, I thought the hour of prayer was in the morning. Well, it's whenever you want it to be. And they go up to the temple, and they come to the gate beautiful. Now, if you look up in a, a Bible dictionary, a Bible concordance, there, is, it, there, there was never a gate called the beautiful gate. They're not actually sure. They have an idea about the beautiful gate, but they're not sure which one was the beautiful gate. And, and this particular account is so amazing because here is this man who is lame who cannot go through the beautiful gate because he is marred and cannot go in there. He is outside the beautiful gate, uh, unable to go in, when Peter and, and John show up. I don't know how old Peter was, but I know that John wasn't very old. Most surmised because he lived to at least... 90 some AD, which was 60 years uh, from there, that he was probably still just a teenager. If Jesus was crucified in about 30 uh, AD, which he, he probably was, somewhere around 30 AD, uh, he ministered for three and a half years, and uh, it, it, his, his birth probably about 3 BC, somewhere around there. And Jesus died in about 30. Uh, John was not very old, but it appears that John accompanied Peter. That Peter was John's hero. Uh, he followed the old guy around. The old guy probably needed help. I don't know. You know he's an old guy. And, 
And they go up through the temple gate and up the gate beautiful. And there's that, there's that lamb, lame man laying there. And he says, give me some money. Somebody said, who's the shortest man in the Bible? Peter. I didn't know that. He said, silver or gold have I not, and no man can be shorter than that, but you'll get it anyway. But, but Peter and, and John, they go up, and Peter said, silver or gold have I none. But such as I have, I give thee. Now, one of the things that that was necessary, there were signs that, that proved that what they were preaching was true. The Bible says the signs of an apostle, that the apostles had the ability. I'll say this really quick. That's one thing about speaking in tongues. If you'll note that what, there are only three instances of that in the book of Acts, and every time it, it occurs, an apostle is present. So anyway, Peter says, Peter and gold, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus, rise more. And he took the man by the hand, and he immediately, it even says later that the shadow of Peter and John passing over people would heal them. I mean, how miraculous. Man, I, I believe the Bible says he was over 40 years old. Now he's outside the beautiful gate, can't go in, but he is healed. And now he passes through the beautiful gate into the temple area where he'd never been. What a picture of you and I. I, man, good night, man. We're lost. We're undone. We're lame. We, we, we can't do anything. We can't enter the beautiful life. We don't know what it's like to be saved. We don't know what it's like to go have an, an assurance of our salvation. We don't know what it's like to possess the Holy Spirit of God. We don't know what it's like to have friends that are saved. We don't know anything like that. And then we get saved. And then we enter into the beautiful life. We enter into the, the joy don't you think that guy was happy? He jumps up. Well, now the Pharisees are getting a little upset. They don't, they don't like it. And so a notable miracle has occurred. Peter preaches again, verse 19. Repent ye therefore of chapter 3. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heavens, etc. And, and Peter preaches unto them and trouble is about to begin. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Herodians, the lawyers, the scribes, those guys are about to get involved. Now, Jesus said, go ye into all the world. And until this point, they hadn't. They hadn't even left Jerusalem yet. But they're about to. And we, we will pick up uh, in Acts. I love the book of Acts. Uh, I read John continually. I read Acts more uh, after that. Uh, what a fantastic book this is on what God can do. And God, God can do. I mean, God can do that today. God can do that. Father, we thank you. Lord, for your word. Lord, tonight. Lord, we're still, we're still in the book of Acts. We're still... We're still going. Church is still here. As our brother said, Lord, a little, little lukewarm. A lot of churches are a little lukewarm. Not fervent. Not passionate. But there was something different about those apostles. You, you just can't explain. Holy Ghost in them? Yeah, we, that, that one. But the fact they had seen a, a dead man lie. The resurrected I believe it's in the book of Hebrews. Seeing him who is invisible. Oh God, may we. Oh God. Oh Father. May we, may we catch a glimpse of the 
resurrected Christ. Empower us, we pray. Use us, we pray. And this last, Lord, I believe we're in the final scene of the third act of world history. Not many people are interested. Not many people really care. They'll care one day. They'll cry for the mountains and the rocks to hide them from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne. God, I pray you'll help us have compassion on some making a difference. Lord, we pray. And, oh, God, may our prayer be passionate. Bless our prayer time tonight. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. All right, I left my book at home to Friends, this is Pastor Jim Jenkins, and we are delighted that you have been able to be with us today on this Lord's Day. Hope that you have enjoyed the message and would invite you to come be with us. Catch us each week, 9.30 for Sunday school, 10.30 for church, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. If we may be of some spiritual help to you, feel free to contact us at 315-348-6271. God bless you, and have a good day.